Hey guys, and welcome to the menstrual cycle and physique development PowerPoint. Now, what we wanted to do here at Vila Physique was provide you, our clients, um, even if you're not our clients watching this, just a, a resource um, by which you can understand um, what happens in the menstrual cycle itself, um, the different phases across the month, um, and, and how that really might affect things such as body weight, your mood, your strength, your recovery, etc., etc. But the whole purpose of this is to try and uh, to put it across in as, as layman's terms as, as I can do. So, for those of you that are pretty well inept with physiology, um, I will be grossly uh, simplifying this as best I can um, for the purposes of those that maybe perhaps don't know too much about physiology or science. Um, so what I would say is, if you're watching this and you perhaps know a bit about physiology, there should be a, a time, um, a sort of time schedule below in the comment section. You you know you you can be just literally flip to the um, the point of the, the the presentation that you want to know about, um, and rather than sit through um, some of the physiology stuff. So um, the aim of the presentation itself um, is to help. I've said females, but really to help males and females, because some of, the, some of you guys watching this might be coaches. Um, so to help you understand the basic hormonal changes that happen across the month um, in the menstrual cycle. And I think if you're watching this as a female and you're thinking, oh, um, but I'm on birth control, um, that won't affect me. Well, I'll, I will get to birth control um, in a little bit. And I apologise if I do waffle on this PowerPoint presentation. It might take um, a long time, but I promise you if you sit through this, you take some notes, maybe perhaps you ask me some questions after it, you'll have a much better understanding of what's going on um, across the month. So we aim to provide a deeper understanding um, on how these changes may affect strength, body temperature, metabolism, hunger, etc, etc. To explain why we may see, may see variation in scale weight, water retention across the cycle, across the month. Um, to discuss the effect that stress and hormonal birth control can have on each phase. I understand that there's other um, other methods of, of birth control. Uh, we're going to specifically talk about hormonal. Um, and, you know, as I said, the ultimate aim is to do this, um, put this all across in layman's terms, and just, I guess, try and reassure you that if you are a female watching this, that the menstrual cycle will not stop you achieving results. Um I personally have worked with hundreds of, of females across the ages um, over the years and regardless of their cycle, um, we've been able to get incredible results. I've had some females be on cycle literally when they're doing a, a photo shoot um, by which they look incredibly lean and, and it's, it's obviously perhaps not doesn't feel the best for them, um, but we've still been able to achieve some, some brilliant results. So. I guess before we kind of go into the changes of what you can see, we have to have a basic understanding of the, the physiology itself and kind of just what's going on. Um, so there might be some big words here, some fan, you, you see, might be some fancy words, um, but I'd ask that you do stick with me. Um, and, and just a reminder for anyone that is, um, you know, has, has a, a fair amount of knowledge in regards to physiology, I'm going to try and gross it. You know, simplify it as best I can, just simply because um, that's, that's what our target audience, uh, that's what they like. So this here is a, is a diagram that I'm sure if you're first looking at it, you're probably going, what the fuck? <laughs> There's so much going on, right? But by the end of this presentation, I, I hope that you're able to, to understand what's happening in what phase. Um, and, and to kind of go away with some clarity on that. And hopefully, you, you know, you can go away and explain it to um, a friend, your client, whatever it is. Um, but we're going to really kind of delve deep into, um, you know, literally the, the signal of how this starts, how this happens, how say like a, when I say a follicle, we're, we're, we're literally talking about uh, an egg, you know, an immature egg, how that's going to sort of develop um, in relation to that, how things such as body temperature will change, the hormones which are coming perhaps from a little bit further north in the brain and um, how they change over the time and then what they do, what they cause. Um, and then of course what happens here in the sort of uterus from menses itself, 
from then the build up of that endometrium um, to then shedding. If you're wondering what endometrium is, it's just the innermost lining of of a woman's uterus. Um, because I will probably refer to that quite a lot. Now, average for this will be 28 days, but what I must, must uh, say of huge importance is that every female is going to be completely different. And although we have an average of 28 days, it's not to say that some females can be a little bit shorter than that, some, some females can be a fair bit longer than that. Um, so please, if you're watching this, understand that I'm speaking in terms of averages and, and quite loosely. Um, but it will also be individual um, to, to the person. So part one, hormones. Now, where does it all start? So believe it or not, the process starts um, in, the, in the brain. And there's a little, well, I wouldn't say, wouldn't say it's little, but there's a part of the brain called the, the hypothalamus. Um, we'll get to this in a, in a second, but we're just going to start with, with chatting it through. So this hypothalamus, you could say, just call it like a center in the brain. It releases a, a certain hormone, right? And that hormone is called GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone. Now, that's a very big word. So we're just going to call it GnRH, all right? But all you need to know is that there's a part in the brain called hypothalamus. It releases this hormone to a different part of the brain called the anterior pituitary, all right? And you'll see that again in this next diagram i'll talk literally all this through that anterior pituitary will produce two different hormones so it starts in the brain and it's it's now went from hypothalamus different part of the brain and now we're sort of trending downward towards the ovaries so we've got fsh which is a follicle stimulating hormone so if we were to think about ovarian follicles right and, and then being stimulated, each ovarian follicle is going to contain uh, an immature egg as such. All right, so we have something called the follicle stimulating hormone, so you, you can kind of guess what that does. Um, and then we have something called LH, which is called luteinizing hormone. And both these, both these hormones will be really crucial and essential for different parts of the cycle, and, and they will have like varying levels that will cause things such as ovulation, um, other things such as when we see a dip in one, one hormone, we'll see, right, that's when the specific ovarian follicle that's going to be chosen to, to be released and uh, will be chosen and then released. Um, so, again, we'll talk through that. And as I said, these, well, I didn't say this, but these hormones themselves will have a, a downstream effect on ovarian hormones. So hormones that are, for the most part, um, I know that someone's watching this going, yeah, Vaughn, but they're also synthesized like in the adrenals. I'm going to specifically just talk about uh, the ovaries. So these these ovarian hormones, estrogen, progesterone, androgens, um, I'm going to solely discuss like the, the effect the FSH and is having on these, not, not bringing anything else into play. So I feel that it's a lot better to, to get more of an understanding when we see a sort of picture um, of how things are going on. So I said, you know, just think there's a signal in the brain, these two parts, hypothalamus and pituitary, just, just imagine them as in the brain. All right, so we've got the signal from the hypothalamus releasing GnRH, right, to then have an effect on the anterior pituitary. That then, t that, this, this GnRH then tells the anterior pituitary, okay, boys, right, we want to release, I should have said giggles, eh? <laughs> okay, girls, we want to release LH, FSH. From there, these two hormones, as I said, have an effect on the ovaries and then thus estrogen and progesterone production. All in turn, this whole system here will have an effect on the uterus itself. Now, the other thing we need to bear in mind is that we have a, a negative feedback and perhaps a positive feedback loop as well of what's going on. So how is this system regulated? Well, it kind of regulates itself. You could say if we are in sort of homeostasis and, and in a point of, of balance, we're not trying to, you know, say gain muscle, you know, drop body fat. We're just sort of trying to be as we are. Um, and, and we're at a maintenance phase and there's not too much stress on the body. We would have this system just somewhat regulate itself. So when it notices okay, we've got increasing levels of progesterone in the second half of the cycle, right? You know what? We don't need any more GnRH. We don't need any more 
LHFSA, it's just let us do our thing, right? And I'll talk through as this sort of presentation goes on of why um, why that is important. So if you're still, like, if you got to this point and you've thought, fuck this, oh my God, I'm going to click exit, I, I don't give a shit, um, please just bear with me, right? With with each slide that we go on, it will make a little bit more sense. Um, I will also have a supporting document for this. Um, if you're one of my clients, you'll more likely already be sent it by now. If you are someone that's just watching this and you aren't one of our clients and you would like it, um, please just do reach out um, to me and I can ping it over um, via email or you could put a sort of download, a download box on the website. So we're going to start by talking. We're not, like we've discussed sort of the hypothalamus pituitary of like of that's sort of them. All you need to know the importance um, for this presentation. We're just going to focus on FSH. Now, I really like this graph, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to move uh, my face down, up a wee bit, sorry, just so you could see that graph itself. So, this graph will, it'll be in a, quite a few slides, and I'm always going to refer back to it, just so that you can get more of an understanding of kind of what's going on. So, if we start with just FSH, that follicle stimulating hormone, and, and sort of, not disregard the other lines, but it'll all come together in the end. So FSH itself, as you can see, has varying levels across the menstrual cycle itself. It's crucial for the function and regulation of that first half of the cycle. It is going to stimulate estrogen production. So I understand that this is spelt with EST and uh, we spell it the British way, but for the purpose of the presentation, exactly the same thing. So it promotes the growth and maturation of ovarian follicles. Remember what I said, ovarian follicles, um, they're pretty much the, the basic unit of female reproductive biology, right? And, and each one will contain uh, an immature, immature egg, effectively. Now, we'll have a certain amount of follicles that will be chosen to, to, to start um, growing effectively before one one would be released, and, and that's effectively what FSH is going to do. Now, as as it's promoting the growth and these maturation of these ovarian follicles, what it's actually doing is these ovarian follicles themselves they secrete estrogen on their own. All right, so not only is FSH you know stimulating the production of estrogen, but as a byproduct of that, we're we're still ramping up estrogen levels simply because of of its downstream effects. So again, this is why from here, as FSH begins to rise, estrogen itself is staying pretty steady. And then there's a certain point here by which then estrogen decides to shoot up. Again, we'll get to that soon. And what's it going to do? It's going to promote endometrial growth in the first half of the cycle. The way I would, I would look at it, um, again, is trying really simple follicle stimulating hormone stimulates a, a follicle an ovarian follicle which we know there's you know there's a lot of them and um, all of which contain an immature egg right nice simple concept so the this simple uh not simple but what this graph itself um just just for the purposes of this this uh powerpoint to add to the first half of the cycle and um, i'll probably say this in a later slide the uh this little drop here where you see if FSH drops, uh, that's where the chosen ovarian follicle um, will be released. So there's a few of them, you could say, more than a few that are sort of chosen to, to grow. When FSH drops here, that's when one of them will be released. So LH, luteinizing hormone. So we've spoken about FSH in the first half of the cycle. We'll speak about LH and what it does. So it's crucial for the, the function slash regulation, you could say, of the of the second half of the cycle. It has to work in, in tandem with FSH. And I guess what I should say is that both, both parts of the cycle are very much dependent upon each other. And one if one part wasn't working, the other part wouldn't um wouldn't be present. So what is LH going to do? Now what you'll see here is there's a there's a quite a big rise in LH just before ovulation happens. So effectively, what we're going to say is LH itself is going to trigger ovulation, run roughly about day fourteen 
of an average 28 day cycle. As I said, it could be a few days less, few days like more, depending upon the, the cycle of the individual female. And what it's going to do is going to trigger the secretion of progesterone and androgens. Now, if we look at estrogen as a as a growth hormone, hormone, then progesterone itself would be a maturation hormone, right? And, and I'll get to that in a second. But LH itself, you could you could say maintains the the second half of the cycle. So with without this sudden rise in LH around ovulation time we wouldn't get a, an egg being released. Therefore, that egg itself wouldn't then secrete progesterone. And again, you're thinking, whoa, whoa. I understand I'm, I'm maybe going a little bit forward, but um, I'm trying, like, you'll see by the end of this why I'm trying to bring it all together. So the, the two, two hormones we've discussed so far, FSH, their varying levels, LH, and you can see in this second half of the cycle, LH and FSH are rock bottom, but we'll get to that in a second. So as LH starts to rise, we can see here that boom, progesterone in itself again starts to rise. LH suddenly drops and progesterone continues to rise. So you're probably thinking, well, how, how the fuck does that happen? How's it what happens there? So, firstly, estrogen in itself in a female. What is estrogen's actions or functions? Again, understanding that I'm my face is in the way. There we go. Um so estrogen. Stimulates building of the endometrium. Remember, endometrium is just the inner part of a female's uterus. It will lubricate the vagina, uh, maintains female characteristics, um, maintains skin and blood vessels, normalizes HDL, LDLs, and promotes sleep quality. Um, as I said, estrogen can be primarily described as a as a growth hormone, whereas progesterone is more of a, a maturation hormone. Now. Estrogen itself has has primarily three forms. So we've got E1, which is primarily produced during menopause. Um, E2, primary, primary like produced during um, reproduction. Um, and E3, primarily produced during pregnancy. Now, if we were to, to talk about sort of circulating levels um, in any female that it perhaps isn't pregnant or during menopause or whatnot, E3 would be the highest one that is like in circulating levels. Um, however, it is not quite as potent as the other ones. E2 here um, is the one that's the most potent. In fact, it's 80 times more potent than E3. And it is 12 times more potent than E1. So you can see here, however, though we've got more circulating levels of E3, E2 is far more potent than, than it. So in general, again, for, for the purposes of this presentation, if we're thinking of grossly oversimplifying the physiology, we're just pretty much discussing E2. Right, symptoms of low estrogen slash high estrogen. Um, low estrogen, I suppose we could say, um, if, if you are perhaps uh, menopausal, um, perhaps you will see these symptoms here you know i put emotional instability you could say you know um just 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 that your mood or mood regulation is is perhaps poor but poor sleep low motiv motivation to train decreased libido uh, vaginal dryness poor squint squint poor skin and hair quality um increased ldl um decreased hl levels you wonder what they are low density light proteins high density light proteins um not to get into it but that has just an effect of on say cholesterol um, and kind of what's going on in regards to um sort of fatty deposits within just within blood vessels uh high like symptoms of high estrogen we've got excessive bleeding headaches again <laughs> emotional instability so this kind of happens when we're low uh, when you're low or high um, gallbladder dysfunction thyroid dysfunction and uh linked to pcu pcos endometriosis infertility um, for the purposes of this presentation, we're not going to discuss PCOS or endometriosis. Um, that is a, could go down a whole different rabbit hole and could be a whole different PowerPoint. Um, so we won't discuss it for the, the this presentation. But that's just the symptoms of what we perhaps we would maybe see if we had a sort of low and a high estrogen state. So progesterone is one thing that we haven't got into um, as of yet. Again, I'm just moving myself down. 
So progesterone, as, as we've talked about before, it can be seen as a, a maturation sort of hormone. Um, it's you know, produced in the ovaries and tail cells to mature. Um, it is also produced by the corpus luteum, which again you're thinking, what the fuck does that mean? So effectively, like it just stands for like a big fat yellow mass. Um, you can actually say it looks a little bit like a jammy dodger. Um, but this, so we we have the sort of we talked about the ovarian follicles, right? And once that's re- once that's released, once it ovulates, um, it becomes this thing called the corpus luteum, which in itself secretes its own progesterone. So this is where if we go back to here and we saw progesterone continuing to rise although LH drops, now you can understand why. Um, so without the corpus luteum, progesterone production would diminish and we effectively wouldn't have the the second half of the cycle. Progesterone, um, I guess you could say before this is, before we have ovulation, must must reach um, a, a decent level, don't say a decent level, must, must reach a certain level for the second half of the, the cycle to be maintained. Um, because what we are trying to do, when I say we, uh, what what this what the system's trying to do is that we is trying to mature the endometrium and make it a, a viable place in case we you know we see conception so that it can embed and implant into that endometrial wall. Um, if we haven't got progesterone at high enough levels, we won't get the maturation needed to get that implantation. So hopefully that kind of gets your thought process behind why we need to have progesterone at. Um, it has to get to adequate levels. So the functions of progesterone, as I said before, are going to promote the maturation of the endometrial lining, um, increase cervical mucus, um, and inhibit lactation. Is that all? I'm sure you're wondering. Um, women do produce small amounts of testosterone in the ovaries, um, and approximately that's about one fifteenth um, when you compare that to to a male. Um, why does that matter? Um, there's actually a small peak around that time of ovulation. So I go back to here, just as you ovulate, as, as you get a burst in LH, just before ovulation happens, that's when you'll have a small spike of testosterone. It's not on this graph, um, but what does that do? Um, it increases the ability to give it the beans. Um, you see, that's where you might feel that your strength just around that sort of day, uh, maybe perhaps is, is at its possible highest in the subsequent couple of days after, um, you may just find that you feel like an absolute, you know, you may, you may feel like superwoman in the gym itself. So part two, um, I'm trying my best not to fire through this as quick as I can, but understand that I, I'm trying to make sure it doesn't go on for, for too long. Um, but part two, the, the cycle phases in itself. So we've spoken a little bit about FSH, we've spoken about LH, we've spoken about estrogen, We've spoken about progesterone, but let, let's look at, if we can, putting that all together and breaking that down. So if we take that original graph that you've seen, um, and then this here, that is from, um, if I go back to the very start, uh, that's from this graph here. It's just a screenshot, right? So coming back to that same slide that we were on. So we've talked about FSH, LH, and what they do where they're produced from, obviously, in the brain, the varying levels, what happens in LH prior to prior to ovulation, um, estrogen progesterone. So that follicular phase in itself is the first 14 days. So for them, again, this is going to be included in, um, we're, we're going to include menses in that because it is part of um, the effect with the first, the first part of the follicular phase itself. And although you, if you're a female watching this, are maybe perhaps sharing the, the line of the endometrius, and that's just when a, when a female will bleed on cycle. Um, in that point, the ovarian follicles, which we've spoken about, they're growing, all right? Um, why? You can see here FSH levels are increasing. As FSH, as FSH levels are starting to increase, um, estrogen itself, again, is starting to, is starting to rise. Um, I actually said this in an earlier slide, when FSH levels drop, which is here, um, that's when this sort of chosen follicle out of, you know, again, if we say for argument's sake, there was five, right? Let's say 
one of them out of that five, now there's probably going to be a bit more than that, but just for the purposes of an example, one out of those five, that's when the body's like, right, that's the one that we are going to choose to release. Um, so as this follicle starts to grow, or as the follicles like grow themselves, that's when they secrete a little bit more estrogen. So in these sort of first 14 days, FSH levels are a high, ovarian follicles themselves are growing, um, and that's where estrogen in itself again starts to begin to rise. What's estrogen doing? It's telling this, once we've once that lining's been shed, it's then telling the endometria, like that it's now effectively growing um, the lining of, you could say, endometrial has been shed and a new lining has been, has sort of been starting to grow. Um, estrogen, estrogen rise promotes the growth of the endometrial lining, I've just said that. Um, and the endometrial lining growth produces progesterone receptors. Okay, so as estrogen is starting to grow, have an effect on the endometrial lining, that's where we know that, um, like we can see from the graph here, progesterone in itself rapidly increases, um, but progesterone in itself is essential for the maturation of this endometrial lining. Um, to add to that, we know that the that jammy dodger we spoke about produces its own progesterone um, as well as uh, LH have an effect on ovaries to produce progesterone, both of which will then have an effect on the, um, the endometrial lining itself and help th this part of the cycle, um, well, mature. We'll stick with what's happening with what's happening here. Still in the follicular phase itself, I'm going to move my face up again so you could see here. Um, so the follicular phase, what, what's happening? So again, if we think of kind of what's going on from the brain downwards, um, brain, hypothalamus, GnRH, anterior pituitary, then we've got LH and FSH here, all right? So the surge in estrogen around day 10, which is here, um, causes a massive rele release of LH, okay? So we've got FSH in itself um, having an effect on um, estrogen production, those follicles are producing estrogen. So then we get a sudden rise and that release is about sort of 10 times that of which we'd usually get from this anterior pituitary. Um, and it's this surge, this sort of rise in LH which stimulates ovulation for argument's sake around day 14. Both LH and estrogen uh, will tend to drop off the day before ovulation. And you could see that from the graph in itself. So we've had a massive rise of LH, estrogen's risen with that, um, and then just before ovulation, both of them begin to dip. Luteal phase, so that, that effectively completes the follicular phase, we could call it. Now, the luteal phase in itself, as we said, the maturation of the endometrial lining, mostly from progesterone. Um, so this this ovarian follicle, as I said, becomes a corpus luteum, which we know just stands for like a big fat yellow uh, yellow mass. We're just going to effectively call it jammy dodger. Follicle cells now become lutein cells, or luteinization occurs. Again, not something to be overly concerned about. But um, this corpus luteum, as I said before, causes a an increase in progesterone um, and a little estrogen. So we see, we talked about the estrogen in that, in that phase prior. If I could just go back here. In that phase prior, estrogen drops down prior to ovulation. Then you can see it suddenly start to come back up. Progesterone just continues to rise throughout because this here is producing progesterone. But the reason estrogen goes back up is again, because effectively that's what's happening from, from the fall or the corpus luteum, should I say. Um, Increasing progesterone causes a drop, massive drop in LH and FSH, and you're probably thinking, well, well, why, why is that? If I go back here, we we see that as progesterone is being secreted, it's got a, a negative feedback loop on this part of the the two parts of the brain, right? So what it's doing is as those levels start to increase here, it's telling this part of the brain, listen, we do not need these two do not produce them, you don't need to. So then effectively, that's why we see LH and FSH drop off. Um, 
the phase will finish and move into menses, which effectively is the beginning or you know of the follicular phase. You'll see pretty much um, two days before menstruation um, is when progesterone drops massively um, along with the estrogen. As that drops, that's that kind of signal. Um, for, like that would be then that signal to the brain to say, right, it's dropped. So you know what? We also, like, you can start producing this again because we're shedding. So we need to then have a new endometrial lining in place for perhaps the next time in case, perhaps we conception in the next cycle. So menses itself, um, around 26 days, the that corpus luteum degenerates. So that's effective, as I said, in that just two days before, um, two days before that, like we get we get a bleed, progesterone drops. If the ovum, the egg, whatever you want to call it, is infertilized, and um, that sudden drop in progesterone, um, um, but there'll be a sudden drop in progesterone and menstruation begins two days later, which hopefully you can see that graphical representation now. We're seeing right, okay, this is a follicular phase, that's where, where menses, menses is, and we then get the, the growth and maturation of that endometrial line. Uh, sorry, we get the growth of the endometrial line here, it then matures, and you can kind of see how, how it starts try to be depicted in the actual. Um, diagram itself is just see the increase like increases in the sort of like the, the the size of the wall itself but also like the blood vessel thickening of it and um, before it then obviously degenerates so i hope now you can look at this here apart from the body temperature and get a rough understanding of okay right that that first half of the cycle the follicular phase um we know fsh in itself uh will will rise and um, it will then fall go in the second phase we know that lh will, will massively rise because the surge in estrogen here then causes ovulation we know that they both really rapidly drop and um, in that second half we know that the sort of this corpus luteum secretes progesterone as well as a little estrogen so we see estrogen uh, sorry progesterone continue to rise estrogen sort of comes back up we know this negative feedback loop um from uh from progesterone is telling the pituitary in the brain do not you know you do not need to release lh and fsh so keeps keeps them low uh, right until we see massive drop in progesterone the degeneration of that endometrial lining lining sorry and then of course the the beginning the sudden rise it's not a sudden rise but the little rise in fsh why because it's going to then go boom back into back to the start so hopefully that now makes sense um and i guess it was really crucial and important from from my end that if you're watching this and if you're one of my clients to just understand that process before we get into what that can potentially do in regards to changes across the week at, in the month in regards to your mood and your, temp, uh, your body temperature etc um because it's all well and good knowing that but i think the understanding the reasons behind behind like behind why it does it will, will ultimately give you a more of a grasp more of an understanding and less of perhaps a an emotional response when you see a change, a change on the scales. It, it's all well and good me saying, listen, around this time you're at your heaviest, around that time you're at your lightest, but actually just knowing, right, okay, the, the logical reasons why you process it a little bit different. So part three, why, why does it all matter? So changes over the month sort of coincide with what's happening here with the, the varying sort of hormones, LH, FSH, progesterone and estrogen we are going to notice some other trends. Now that will include body weight fluctuations, water retention, um, changes in strength, changes in body temperature, um, your metabolism hunger, digestive issues, um, and also changes uh, to mood slash motivation to train. So body weight, water retention. Now what I've tried to do is give like a, a table um, example here of kind of what's going on with um, within each phase. So changes in estrogen and progesterone across the month will have a, a direct effect on sodium levels within the body, right? As a result, this will change intra and extracellular water concentrations. A fancy word to say you're going to retain water at certain points across the month and other points across the month you're not going to retain quite as much water. Now as a as a consequence of that, again moving myself up here, um we will we will see a, a fluctuation in body weight. So early follicular phase, when we know FSH is a little bit higher, estrogen 
is is it beginning to rise um water retention is you could say quite low and wh- when i say early follicular i'm referring to after menses after you've bled after you've bled it'll probably be roughly about 48 48 to 72 hours you'll see the lowest reading across the month um and your body weight will be at its absolute lightest. And then late follicular phase, right before we perhaps see ovulation, um, we'll see a small increase. Now, we, we remember before ovulation, we see a surge in estrogen, uh, we see a surge in LH, um, and the scale weight will, will reflect a little bit heavier because we've got a little bit more water, water increase. Early luteal phase, we know that we see a drop in that estrogen, we also see a drop in uh, LH and FSH, small decrease, body weight slightly lower, but not at its lowest. And then late luteal phases, progesterone begins to rise. We will see um, body weight be at its highest, and your body's sort of like it, the way it holds on to water be at its highest. So when you look at it like that, it, it really makes sense to, to not compare body weight from one phase to the next right it, it makes sense to compare right so let's say this is Feb- february i'm recording right week one in february i'm going to compare that that body weight to week one in march to week one in april and so on and so forth um just because you could easily see and i've seen this in some people themselves that they've maybe perhaps been ticking all the boxes they're in a dieting phase right and week one of the cycle um or you know, sorry, week one in that early follicular phase, boom, we see, we see the lowest weight, and then late luteal phase, there could be literally like four to five pounds of a difference, and if someone's like trying to diet and get down to a certain uh, you know, level of condition, that can be really sort of, really harming on their, their their mental state, and they could instantly feel like, oh my god, you know, I'm I'm not that I'm not doing doing what I should, and I'm a failure, and oh my god, I'm I'm fat, blah blah. Whereas if if I could let you know, well, listen, this is natural and we're going to expect to see this and you're ready for it. It should then, we should then respond a little bit differently. Um, one would hope uh, to, to that change in, in body weight. So what I would say is only be comparing, I would compare the, you know, I would say compare the average of week one, the average of week two, average of week three, rather than comparing every single day because otherwise that'd be a massive, massive Excel sheet. So strength. Um, the studies that I looked at really showed no definitive conclusions um, when it came to varying levels of strength and that kind of led me to saying that it's going to be really sort of person dependent. I have made a a table of um, what I've sort of found anecdotally and a little bit from what the studies were saying but in the words of Corinne Ingham um, who for those of you who don't know is a a female female bodybuilder and she's been on the podcast itself. Um, She is the the partner of Trained by JP, Jordan Peters, um, they're not going to cancel the show because you're on your period. You know, if you look at it simply, your your logbook isn't going to to know whether you're on your period. You know, we, we, if we have our, an intent of getting stronger across the the months and the years, it, it's not going. Your logbook's not going to not going to tell you, hey, listen, you're at this part of your cycle, um, just back off a little bit. However, uh, in some cases. I, we could perhaps, um, you know, say, right, okay, th- this this week we're going to sort of um, have not an intent of progressing but an intent of holding the best we can. That's what I would opt for um, rather than try and say, no, we're going to completely change your training. But I'll get to that in a second. Um, so early follicular phase, um, menses in itself, strength appears to be a bit lower. And that's just because wh- when I spoke to my female clients, they've said that they just perhaps don't feel quite as um they don't feel quite as just good within themselves you know as they're training um they feel quite uncomfortable at times um then once that's finished sort of late late follicular highest why small spike in testosterone that makes sense the ability to give it more beans early luteal maybe perhaps they feel slightly decreasing late luteal leading into them being on cycle a little bit lower um so then should, should we change training at different parts of the cycle personally I think no, and the reason I, I say that and come from that standpoint is that um, the majority of my clients are working in a gaining phase or in a dieting phase. And in a dieting phase, if I tell them to back off the gas and we get less energy expenditure, um, it then sort of can compromise the, the the rate of fat loss that we're looking to achieve that that week. Um, 
Whereas in a gaining phase, I often feel they've got enough food in the system to still support anabolism, still support muscle growth, um, and still kind of at least maintain their numbers that week. And maybe instead they focus on improving exercise execution, opposed to, right, let's add another sort of 10, uh, sorry, five, five kilos on the bar. Body temperature. Um, body temperature can rise by half a degree before ovulation occurs. Um, and this is just due to the, the rising levels of progesterone. Now, why why is that? Why is that? Why are we bothered about that? Why is that useful? Um, it can be a really useful tool for females to sort of uh, track where they would be at in their cycle if they have lost their cycle um, and they perhaps aren't bleeding. Um, it can help determine right. Cool. That's where I would usually be ovulating. Um, so that would be where where sort of a bleed is absent. Body temperature can act as that set point to determine which phase that they are in. Um, you can also say it's a tool used as a natural form of, of contraception um, to understand where you would most likely get pregnant. So some females who perhaps want to avoid, um, cont- uh, let's say, a hormonal contraception, oral contraception or, or whatever it is, um, may just go with the, right, okay, um, my body temperature is is went up. Um, I'm ovulating around here. There's a high, ch- high chance of getting pregnant. Then they may perhaps abstain from sexual activity. Um Metabolism and hunger, and then I've got a nice little graphical represent- <laughs> representation of what can be kind of going on and what can be happening. Um, so, basal metabolic rate um, will fluctuate across across the cycle, and these fluctuations will effectively directly impact your hunger. So, how your body's going to sort of process um, fuel that its, it's calories sort of demands and um, what it needs are, are going to be different across the month. Um, Cravings them themselves uh, will be highest in that sort of late luteal phase um, and could potentially, in, in that phase, um, increase your calories by, say, 150, 200 calories a day. You're thinking, why? Well, to coincide with, obviously, cravings and hunger being quite high, what we what we see in that late luteal phase is, is your basal metabolic rate you know, increasing and, and why is that happening? We've got a rise in progesterone. Remember that what, what what your body's trying to do, your body's trying in that phase, it's trying to prepare the body to, you know, for perhaps an implantation of the egg in the uterine wall um, to then start growing a little human, right? So for that, it, it kind of requires a little more calories. Now, why I've said to increase from fats I'm not going to go in this slide because there's a certain slide that's specifically um, directed to that. However, what I would say is if you're a coach watching this, dietary adherence will always trump what's optimal. So in that phase, if someone's at maintenance, right, they're not dieting or gaining or whatever, um, you could effectively add more, say, carbs in if it then abstains them from going and eating all the cake. Does that make sense? Um BMR changes, why is it at its lowest around ovulation? Um, why is hunger at its lowest? From the research I looked into and what I've, what I've kind of heard over the over the years, um, it's an ev- evolutionary response. You know, perhaps back in back in the day, um, our body's main, or the female's you know, main priority at that point is to find a mate. Um, so it, it, it doesn't need to then prioritize any other energy towards any other bodily systems. Um, hunger itself would be lower often you probably find that you know back in back in the caveman days um, i wouldn't imagine that females would be overly active um hunter gatherers at that point i imagine they would be more sedentary maybe perhaps an unconscious thing um but something quite i find quite interesting um and then it's, a, it's usually at its lowest um when you are sort of shedding and often that coincides with hunger being at its lowest as well okay digestive issues i'm just going to move myself so as you can see from the depicted uh, um, picture that didn't even make sense there the depicted picture so <laughs> as you can see from this picture here um, in the late luteal phase if you're a female you're probably probably reading this going you know you can experience proje- the, the progesterone farts so as a female you're if, if you've experienced that you know exactly what I'm, I'm talking about now why why does that happen? Um, progesterone itself, we see that rapid increase in that second half of the cycle. Um, it slows gut motility, right? Pretty much a fancy word of saying that the you know it means that the stools pass through the gut um, quite slowly, 
um, which can lead to a build-up of gas in the form of bloating, burping, or in this case, sort of flatulence. A lot of females as well in that second half of the cycle can um, experience like a little bit of obviously constipation. Um, with this sort of slow gut motility, um, the stools themselves can they pass through the GI tract quite slowly, but they can also break up. And as they break up, um, it can then it can then cause like pellet-like stools. Um, but because they're moving through the gut in sort of pellet form, that's when we can get that sort of by byproduct sulfurous <laughs> um, smell from from flatulence. Um, however, right before menses, um, when progesterone rapidly drops. Uh, stool movement should improve and some females will tell you that literally the day before they their cycle it's just like a, it's like a clear out um so again if that happens if you're experiencing if you're experiencing these sort of digestive issues or whatever it is um please don't be uh, sort of frustrated or alarmed um, it's completely normal um but you most certainly you know it most certainly can happen more, more so in that second uh, second half of the the cycle itself the um changes to metabolism um, and the implications of that so first one carbs right which everybody loves um it's going to change across the month and it's just directly correlated to, to that e- to the levels of estrogen and progesterone um however what you'll tend to find is as your hunger levels and your cravings rise across the the cycle your your body's ability to, to handle those sort of carbs, um, it decreases. And you're thinking, what? You know, you you want all the carbs, but you can't necessarily can't necessarily eat them. So when we look at sort of um progesterone and estrogen itself, we have estrogen and increased insulin sensitivity. However, on the flip side of that progesterone, we get decreased insulin sensitivity. For those of you who don't know, insulin is just a hormone that's just gonna promote um glucose, you could say into adipose tissue, fat tissue, or into muscle mass. So if we've got an increase in insulin sensitivity, we're more so gonna put it into muscle mass, decrease more so into fat. Uh, increased glycogen storage with estrogen, decreased glycogen storage with progesterone, increased glucose uptake with estrogen, decreased glucose uptake with progesterone. So you're kind of seeing the opposites. Um, so if you kind of flip back to an earlier slide, which I said to go with uh, with fats for that increase um, and not carbs, this is potentially why. However. Again, if if I was to give a female client a bit more carbs and she stuck to her diet, um, opposed to I gave her fats, but instead she she didn't adhere and she went off and she ate, you know, we, we saw an excess of thousand extra calories from carbs. Then it's case you know, it's a case of which one's going to be more effective would be the increase in carbs. Um, as a side note, progesterone itself will also increase uh, thermogenesis, so like producing producing heat. So you might feel a little bit more like warmer in that sort of second half um, of that cycle. Fat metabolism. Um, again, change across the month, um, how our body's going to, say, utilise fats for fuel, but also it's how it's going to break them down from our stores. So with estrogen, we could see an increase in fat metabolism, um, increased fat breakdown, increased you know, body fat redistribution, you could say, um, and the complete opposite um, with each one with progesterone, a decreased fat metabolism, Decreased fat breakdown, decreased fat distribution. So I put there, and um, the redistribution is critical role in breaking down fats in the form of, of triglycerides, um, which are thereafter used as 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 fuel or storage within muscle tissue. And by this point, you're probably thinking, right, estrogen's pretty cool, um, and progesterone, like that's for <laughs> its effects are somewhat frustrating. Remember, you you cannot control this. It is it is naturally occurring in every every female's um every female's body but what i would say is remember ju- just because you're in the second half cycle it you know, doesn't mean that you can't still um you know improve your physique and work towards and uh, you know add muscle mass etc etc uh, protein metabolism again similar sort of uh, you know it's going to change across the month directly correlated to change in estrogen and progesterone so in that sort of first half of the cycle we have we would have like an increased ability to to add muscle and whereas when we're, you're a bit more progesterone dominant, decreased ability to add muscle. It doesn't mean that you can't, it's just your ability is not quite as good as when you've got a little more estrogen in the system. Um, remember that there's a little increase in estrogen from that corpus luteum, that jammy dodger, as I said. So you still have an ability to, to add, add muscle mass in that second part. So estrogen though, like less, less muscle breakdown, progesterone, more muscle breakdown. In that sense, we could look at estrogen as being quite anabolic 
and then progesterone has been say catabolic so it doesn't mean that you're going to break down all, all your muscle mass in a second half it just means that you perhaps will be will, will be able like do that more readily so than you would do in that first half if that makes sense remember in, like increasing muscle mass decreasing muscle mass has got a lot to do with your nutritional intake how hard you train your protein timing and so much more but again i'm trying to grossly simplify some of the the effects here um for you so you know with that in mind should we manipulate food types training modalities and total calories across the month um how i'm going to approach this and i think i said this earlier on in the in the presentation is personally i don't and the reason because i think when when a lot of clients come on board um everything's quite overwhelming you know how how we program how we you know do the meal plans the macros and whatnot just getting their head around that um and at the same time achieving a result um can be quite hard to do so you can just imagine you know like if you know after three weeks say all oh, right cool this is where you're at in your cycle let's let's back off the gas let's do this whereas what i'm trying to do with a lot of clients is build up really sort of good habits routines get them at a, get them at a point where everything's just firing on all cylinders and then really i think what what, is, what i need to do as a coach you need like a lot of data you need like say six months of data maybe perhaps they're using an app like whether it's flow or fertility friend or whatever it is before you can get a real idea of that individual female cycle where she ovulates where she where she then usually will be in her second half and her first half which week of the month etc so with that being in mind i would say collate the data and then if you see massively rapidly like rapid changes in like oh my god Vaughn I just completely do not want to train at this part they, then you can have a discussion but I find that females that come on board especially myself and the team there they're, they're so driven in regards to creating a physical change that that's their motivation I think if you're dealing with a lot of general population clients then of course you would then be able to change their training you may be giving them a little bit more calories um but my my female clients if they're in the gaining phase they've already got quite a lot of calories if they're in a the gaining phase if they're dieting i'm probably not going to put their their calories up why because i'm trying to pull off a certain level of body fat that that week and um, that that month cumulative months cumulative weeks whatever it is so that's my reason for why i don't do it um you might be different but again i think that you if you're working with general population clients you would ultimately you could get away with with, with say moving their focus and intent from say weight training to then maybe one week of the month it's more just cv work or it's 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 not that at all it's maybe just perhaps one week of the month they're focusing on just getting their steps in and hitting, hitting their diet um but for my clients the ones that come over for vw physique we don't tend to to make much changes so the last part um i know i've went on for some time and um, but i feel it's all kind of necessary but the, the last part would be the effects of stress and hormonal birth control on the cycle itself. So let me see if I can move move myself up a little bit. So can stress affect the menstrual cycle? Uh, absolutely. So this, um, this diagram here that you saw, we actually call that the HP ovarian axis. Some people might call it HPG, um, you know, which stands for hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis because we talked about it's on an axis because it's got those sort of negative and positive feedback loops um, but overall um, if we have high levels of stress what tends to happen is we'll get a down regulation um, from the hypothalamus of GnRH which means then it's not going to tell the pituitary um, or we get a down regulation of L LH and FSH but I put crosses there to try and just give you a representation of okay th this whole system can effectively switch off if we have high levels of stress but um not only this is the, the hypothalamus itself is intertwined with other other things in the brain such or, or in the body itself so we've got the hp ovarian axis but we've also got something called the hp adrenal axis which is where some other um androgens progesterone resistance are produced in in a female body but for the purposes of the presentation i'm not going into it. um and the the hp thyroid axis um, if one of the like if this system's off if one's off then the rest of them are um, as a coach if, if a female client has come on board and they've they've lost their cycle um, then 
and, and it's you know your prerogative to try and help them regain that. Uh, the first thing you should do, and th- this quote comes from um, Dr. Alf es- Esposito, and if you haven't, go listen to the podcast episode we've done. Uh, we'll cover some of the things that I'm talking about in this presentation. He often says, you know, focus on the thyroid first, then the ovaries. And in that simple term, he was just like, if you're trying to regain your cycle, make sure that you've maybe assessed thyroid um, you support it. You make sure that once, like you, once it's got that support in it, um, then when, once that system's say, say firing, you then look at trying to fire um, and get this back, get this back going. I think that ultimately you can kind of do both at once, um, because it's going to come down to minimizing stress, managing stress as best you can, as as well as perhaps using some supplementation. So. Stress and the menstrual cycle, they've got like a delicate relationship. Uh, they're so intertwined and I've seen, I've just seen so many different um, examples, you could say, over the over the years of how quickly or not, perhaps, some females have regained their cycle from a, from a dieting phase. Um, high levels of cortisol. Um, cortisol is, is what's produced by the body in, in relation to stress, right? So high levels of cortisol have a downregulation um, production of GnRH, as I said, um, which we know is released from the hypothalamus um, and can affect the hormones released from the pituitary. So cortisol in itself is what's causing causing all this to, to go off. Um, increased stress in the body can come from low levels of body fat, um, high workload capacity, you know, training cardio, in a high stress environment such as your work so if we if like w- what you need to realize is that the body will respond to stress in the same way whether it be mental or physical so yes you could say oh well right the reason my cycle is maybe lost and cortisol levels are high is because my cardio is ramped up my training is ramped up there's not a lot of food going in and um, so body fat levels are coming down and um, but at the same time if if like you you know, you just got a really stressful job and it's mentally wearing on you, mentally wearing on you. Your body's still going to be producing high levels of cortisol because you're more towards a branch of the autonomic nervous system, which we know is the, you hear me say all the time, the sympathetic, the fight or flight. That's the system that is going to produce these high levels of cortisol. Um, and another way you could look at it is that when body fat levels get get low, you know, the body's going to deem that the reproduction isn't essential for survival. Your body is a survival machine. It wants to survive. It wants to keep going. And if you pull body fat levels down to, to a certain point um, and it knows, right, well, usually I need to, to increase my metabolic rate at that point to support this that cycle, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to try and conserve my energy because I want to live because, you know, you're maybe perhaps say you're dieting and, you, and you're only putting a certain amount in, and you're not allowing it to add body fat or to those levels are dropping, it, it's going to want to conserve energy. Your body's a conserving energy machine. It loves to do it. It's why with each pound of fat you lose, it becomes so much harder to lose the next one. Um, so that's another way you can look at it. And that ultimately, when a female's went through like a prep for a, a show, uh, whether it be, um, sorry, whether it went to like an extreme prep for a show or a, maybe a photo shoot, and um, one of the main factors at getting the, the cycle back is to not only reduce stress but to add body fat. So, how do we support the, the cycle? Um, I said it before manage the autonomic nervous system, specifically that sympathetic branch, where we know that, that just like the majority of life these days, we're in a chronically stressed environment. Um, as a society, we've become very, very good at coping with high levels of stress and then sort of kind of going unnoticed. As a society, we've become very poor at managing lifestyle factors, our sleep, our digestion, you know. If you're watching this right now, how many times, like, how many times when you're eating are you on your phone? How many times are you in your bed doing your emails? And you're just, con- you're thinking, why does that matter? You're constantly switched on. You're not actively trying to get towards the opposite of fight or flight, which we would call rest and digest. You know, we, we would call that the, the parasympathetic branch of this autonomic nervous system. Again, I know I'm using a lot of fancy words, but I'm hoping that the the simple, simplified words of fight or flight or rest and digest can give you more of an understanding. Um, you now, the only way, you know, autonomic, o- automatic is how you want to look at it. The only way we can we can really interrupt this sort of, this signal is, is by interrupting our breathing rate and our heart rate. 
you know, right now you're breathing without even really a conscious effort. However, you can physically, if you want, you can you can stop breathing, right? So one thing we would want to do is slow our breathing rate down and, and thus slow our heart rate down. In turn, which will favour us more towards this rest and digest state. This is why, like, doing that sort of work or doing that sort of um, activity prior to sleep massively improves sleep. But having times across the day where you're more towards a, a sort of rest and digest state is is what would help manage stress and support the cycle itself. Um, support the thyroid, which I said Dr. Ralph Elspicito said, and from that, literally supplementation. There's, there's plenty of products out there. Um, Complete Strength have a really good one. But a product that's going to contain the likes of zinc, selenium, um, and magnesium. Um we could go down that rabbit hole, but we're not going to what I would just say. Um, on top of that, I said zinc, selenium, magnesium, iodine. Apologies. Um, but the many supplements out there, um, figure out which one's the best for you. Test, retest, make sure that TSH levels are increasing. Seed cycling was something that I've not personally done uh, myself, but Dr. Alf SC was said it on the podcast, and I thought I'd put it down on this presentation here um, so you could see it. Uh, but what he said is uh, consuming different, um, say, seed oils uh, across different parts of your cycle um, can have a, a direct effect on um, seeing an improvement in hormone levels, um, using different seeds to mimic the effect of what those hormones are doing simply because in, in the these sort of seeds themselves, they have what we would call ligands, which are just compounds, which can, can similarly like, bind to it's like quite similar to estrogen progesterone receptors, which is why if you perhaps use them for these three, six months, it could have a similar effect again. I've not used it myself, but you could trial it. That comes from um, Dr. Ralph es Esposito, which is a, he's a functional medicine practitioner in the United States. Um, soy protein itself can raise estrogen levels. I mean, the thing with anything, um, what you would just want to do is always test and retest. How much soy protein are you going to use? Well, you're not just going to have your whole daily consumption from soy, but maybe you would start by changing out your usual consumption of whey um, to switching over to soy. Uh, maybe you'd do it a couple times across the day, do it for four weeks and then see. So that is effectively how we can how we can help support the cycle is manage stress. I guess one thing I've not said is regain body fat, support the thyroid and perhaps util utilize things such as soy protein or seed cycling to help support um, ovarian hormone production. How can we de-stress? It's, it's something that it's funny, like I have, like I'll talk to, to clients about, you know, their stress levels and they go, I'm not stressed. And then I would say, no, you are, you just have a, a very good way of coping with it. Um, so if we think about that sort of interrupting the, that breathing cycle, then this is why things like meditation, diaphragmatic guided breathing work, light static stretching. What do you do when you stretch? Light, light static stretching you tend to interrupt your breathing. You'll deep breathe deeply. Gentle walk-in, Epsom, ba Epsom bath salts, or salt bath, should I say. Um, mindfulness, a gratitude log, use of essential oils, uh, use of supplements like adaptogens, sleep aids, uh, adaptogens such as ashwagandha um, are good. Other other things that may perhaps contain a few adaptogens in one. Um, and then just as a side note, what you could do is you could reduce uh, you could reduce training volume as well because training in itself is is a stressor, right? Um, so how could we de-stress? Like you know, if, if a female client came from a from a really hard prep where they're training five times a week cardio and whatnot, you could easily go three full body sessions across the week, reduce training volume, reduce stress in the body, and help support that cycle coming back. Because the number one thing that a female want to do as they as they have finished their, their competitive season or whatever, is they're going to want to regain that cycle. And, and, and probably they're going to want to gain it back quite quick. As a coach, I kind of have to emphasize, well, we can't control when it comes back, but we can endeavor to do our best to support that. Um, hormonal birth control, this will be the, the last little point again. I know I've rambled on for a long time here. Um, so roughly 44% of the female general population use hormonal contraception. And, and they're not always going to use it for birth control. Some of them are just going to use it to, to regulate their period. Some of them might get um, really, really bad, um, really, really bad cramps. Um, and, and they just want to, to not experience that. Um, it can also be used to, to sort of treat medical con conditions such as PCOS, PMS. Um, and how does it all work? 
you're probably thinking, well, that sort of system that I talked about um, from the brain to the to the ovaries, when we take when you take extraneous by extraneous, I just mean your you know, can't like or the or like the the oral oral pill, um, you shut off that system. Because you're putting it in, then the body's going. Oh, I've got, I've already got this in my system. I don't need to produce it. It then ceases that production. Um, it'll also allow to manage some sort of physiological changes across the month, such as uh, water retention, the bloating, digestive issues, cramps, um, and emotions, or you could say, you know, mood regulation. So types of birth control. Um, the pill, um, you've got different types of, of pills. You've got the combined progesterone and estrogen, um, and then you've got ones that at times can be progesterone only. Um, they can be split into different categories themselves for the most part. Um, you've got what we call monophasic and triphasic, and this just refers to the, the, the pattern of hormone release over, over the month. So... The, the mono progesterone estrogen levels are stayed the same, right? Um, for the for the entirety of the month. Um, whereas the, the triphasic tends to mimic the normal hormonal menstrual cycle. It's just not as, as at the same level um, as you would be from your, your natural production from the brain to the ovaries. So this is where like if we if we know um, sometimes with the mono um, they elevate estrogen in that la- in that sort of third week. Which is why, when you think about it logically, of everything we've spoken about, this is why you'd still see a little bit of water retention, a little bit of fluctuation in scales, right? Because they are like having like they're changing levels of hormones in your body. Which we, if we go back loads of slides, you'll be able to know that that, that those those hormones have different effects on such as water retention, sodium handling, blah blah blah, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, whereas the the tri the triphasic um, mimics normal hormone horm- like the normal menstrual cycle, so you should literally see um, what you would tend to see if you were you were on cycle, um, if you weren't taking oral contraception, should I say, um, oral hormonal birth, birth, uh, birth control, should I say, the you've also got the IUD, um, which this doesn't work through a negative feedback loop, um, th- the rest of them do by which. You will be secreting, um, or you know, if if you're using the sort of patch and implant or whatnot, you'll be secreting hormones that will tell that that sort of HP ovarian axis to shut down, um, or uh, you'll be um, consuming the like consuming the pill um, and and effectively doing the same thing. The IUD works slightly differently, so we don't have that negative uh, feedback inhibition. What we do have with IUD is the IUD is effectively like a copper implant, and what that does is it creates a um, a very, it's not like a poisonous environment, but it creates quite a, a hostile environment, you could say, um, around that uterine wall so that sperm can't really swim um, very well. And at the same time, even if they did and they they were to, um, you were to see conception, uh, the, uh, a fertilized egg would find it very, very hard to implant um, on the uterine wall. Um, because of just the environment with the, the constant sort of copper release. Um, so that's ten, tends to be the type of, of, of birth control. As I said, how do they work? Um, so we've got this this signal from the brain, which you've seen before. You saw this at the very start of, of this PowerPoint. Um, we have like a, as I said, a negative feedback inhibition minus the IUD. Um, a reduction in LH production uh, reduces estrogen production in the ovaries. A reduction in FSH production uh, that says FH. I said FSH um, prevents a follicle um, forming, and thus no ovulation occurs. And thus, there's no corpus luteum to provide higher levels of progesterone. An end result is that estrogen progesterone levels are significantly lower um, than they would be uh, if if we perhaps. Um, weren't taking this sort of um, this sort of negative feedback inhibition. So, I hope from from everything I've said that you kind of understand. Uh, I said this before. You understand what this means. But just as a as a sort of recap, if you were taking like let's say the triphasic birth control, you would see similar um, sort of levels in regards to progesterone 
and estrogen across the month, but we know that there's a down regulation of FSH and FSH, FSH and LH. So this is why you wouldn't see these fluctuations. They would literally be bottomed out the whole time. So we wouldn't see a rapid rise in estrogen. And because we wouldn't see a rapid rise in it, that you then wouldn't see a rapid rise in LH. Remember, it's LH that causes ovulation. So because we, we're taking this say birth control that causes this negative feedback inhibition we don't get ovulation however the the sort of secretions that you're having the secretion you'll be getting from from whichever you're taking will still mimic the um the likes of what you're seeing just not to the same leveling degree if that makes sense but fsh and lh would effectively be taken out of this graph um, if we were looking at sort of just the, the cycle from a progest uh, from progesterone regulation um, standpoint, if we're on hormonal birth control, um, different of different of course, if you were on a progesterone only pill, um, and if you've looked at some of the things we've discussed in this PowerPoint, um, if you're constantly on a progesterone dominant, uh, sorry, progesterone only pill, um, it, and you experience any of the sides that we've spoken about, you now have sort of a an understanding of why that is. Um, some of the side effects uh, of sort of hormonal birth control, um, they can really vary from, from person to person. Um, I should say not just hormonal birth control, but any birth control in general. Um, most females will tend to notice the, the fluid retention um, and that is simply because you know, I've spoke about the monophasic or the triphasic. Um, there's still a, a, a nor like kind of still a varying level of those hormones. So we still see a, a, a slight rise in water, water retention. Um, we still perhaps see uh, um, uh, some digestive issues, some bloating, um, a little bit of kind of weight gain on the scales, whereas some females might not notice any at all. Um, there will be obviously a reduced level um, of testosterone because we're, that, that axis to the, from the brain to the ovaries um, is shut down. Um, Progress will still come down to your sort of calorie intake and your overall energy balance across the month. You know, if you're working on physique goals, um, then sort of the combination um, contraception would probably be preferred, I would say, over the, the progesterone only. Uh, just knowing um, progesterone is, is more sort of, well, we describe it as catabolic and estrogen is, is, is anabolic. Um, but it's not to say... Um, I should I should state this now, not to say that if you're using the progesterone only um, uh, contraception that you cannot still gain muscle mass. You absolutely can, and I've seen it on, I've seen it through hundreds of examples over the years um, with many different females. But um, one thing I would say is that it, I hope that this um, this PowerPoint. Um, it's giving you a little bit of an understanding of just how the, the menstrual cycle works, the reason why some changes happen across the month. But what I would say is that, it, it, you know, these changes will not get in the way of your physique goals and you should not think otherwise or be disheartened or, um, or whatnot when you see um, sort of fluctuation changes in, for example, scale weight or you're not as strong one week or your cravings are up and you don't know why. You want to overreach on the diet and you can't explain it um, and, for, and you're getting annoyed at yourself. I, I think that I hope that you now have a logical explanation of that. So that that is kind of it in regards to the the um, the presentation itself. If you enjoyed this, uh, we, I'd love to know about it. And um, if you wanted to, to know more questions, uh, sorry, if you have questions on it, please feel free to, to drop me a, a DM on Instagram, drop me an email, whatever it is. Uh, I, I do have like a supporting document uh, that, that goes along with this. If you are one of my clients, you've probably already got that. Um, however, if you aren't and you would like uh, like that as a summary, I'd be more than happy to, to just ping you that over. Um, all you need to do is just, just let me know. So I hope that this PowerPoint has helped. Um, as I said, if you have any questions, please do let me know. Um, and wherever you are, wherever you do, give it the beans. <laughs>